What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the 585 Report. Mitch Broder, and I am back alongside Ryan Sullivan. Ryan is back from vacation. I actually been meaning to ask you, Ryan, how was your, your trip? I saw some pictures you posted on Twitter. So I got a little rained on, a little wet on, on, on uh, one hike there. But uh, how was the, your, uh, your time off? It was really good. I enjoyed it. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I did a couple of high peaks. I'm trying to get my 46 in. So I got 25 and 26 in. It, I did my first solo hike, which probably isn't the safest idea in the world, but I did it and it was it was just wet and muddy. And anyone who ever goes up and hikes in the Anirondacks knows how, you, how it can start getting when you get up above 3000 feet there. But also I uh, rented a cabin with some old college friends. And let me tell you, I mean, I'm only 25, but I, I think, you know, you start the age when I just I can't go hard three days like I used to. A after about a day and a half, I needed about a 10 hour nap before I was ready to start going again. So it, 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 I've only been out of college for about five, four or five years now, but it's, it, uh, it's starting to catch up with me. Oh, that's awesome. It sounds like a great time. And also kind of ironic too. I don't know if you can see, I'm actually wearing a Adirondacks Lake Placid shirt. So oh, nice. maybe I even knew that, uh, you know, I, I had that coming, I guess, but anyways, though, Ryan, so we're getting close to training camp. Uh, what are we two weeks now? I believe away or not even a little less than two weeks. So started training camp also announced today that they're going to allow some fans at some, at, I think at three practices that are going to take place in Highmark stadium, which is not that they're doing that. Cause you know, them not being at St. John Fisher is definitely a, a bummer, uh, but fans will be able to attend. But, you know, we kind of talked about it heading into this episode, you know, breaking down the offense and the defense position by position group and kind of previewing what this team's looking like heading into training camp. And, you know, I think we should start with the quarterback position because, for once and for the first time, what feels like, you know, I mean, I think in both of our lifetimes, maybe ever, you know, quarterback, you could argue just not even just the starter at quarterback, but the quarterback room as a whole, it might be the strongest position group on the whole entire roster. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And two spots, you got two locks there and you have Allen, who, like you said, first time in so long that not only do we have an answer going into next year, we know it's a long-term answer. And Travitsky, who is probably a top 35 quarterback in the NFL, which is never bad to have behind your quarterback. And the only question, and you know, it's got, you know, I'm fascinated that it's really got a lot of run on Bill's Twitter and a lot of run in uh, in just in discussion is do we keep a third quarterback and who that third quarterback is it going to be? Is it going to be Jake Fromm, who they spent a fifth round pick on, or is it going to be Davis Webb, who there's actually been some, I forgot who wrote the article with it, so I apologize. Uh, but someone wrote a really good article this offseason about how he's basically kind of become another coach in, in that room and uh, how he's helped with Ken Dorsey and the game planning process and watching tape. So, yeah, I, it, it's funny that the only real controversy is what who is there and who it is at quarterback three. Yeah. I think that that is kind of like an interesting thing because, you know, I believe the bills have never kept three quarterbacks since McDermott took over, except for maybe one year they did, but I know usually they've only gone two quarterbacks. And I think Jake Fromm is really sort of a wild card here because I think, David Webb, Davis Webb most likely is probably going to be on the practice squad. I don't think that he's likely going to make the roster. Uh, but Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean really like their draft picks and keeping them aboard. But I think that the long-term plan was for Fromm to be that backup quarterback. And Mitch Trubisky kind of just sort of fell into their lap a little bit here. And I think with Jake Fromm, I think what it comes down to is, does he show that he has any value during preseason? And if he does do the bills trade him because as of right now, if, if what we know about Jake Fromm, I know a lot of bills fans have this sort of idea of trading Jake Fromm and getting some capital for him. But I don't know about you, Ryan, but personally, I don't really think Jake Fromm's worth much to anybody. Um, you know, he wasn't a high pick. He doesn't have a lot of, you know, high physical tools and hasn't taken an NFL snap of any kind since entering the league. So I think, you know, Jake Fromm's kind of an interesting player here to watch kind of going into this training camp you know and and I, I think you hit on some good points there jake from you know we we talk about all the time and I'll, I'll hit on this point again bean likes to keep his draft picks in house one way or another and jake from you know judge touched on it on his show this week that 
he he did play, you know, he he's got a lot of the similar physical assets to like Nathan Peterman, but he did play three years of SEC football. He was a five, four or five star recruit coming out of college. So he does have some pedigree to him, but really all this is at this point is just a coin flip. Do we don't we've never seen Jake Fromm. We never even really see Jake Fromm throw a football in practice because of the the limits they have on allowing reporters to report stuff during practices during COVID. So no one really knows what Jake Fromm is. It, if he comes out and balls out in preseason, does he have some draft value? Sure. I think the other side of that coin that some people have been bringing up on Twitter is, you know, I think there's a non-zero chance. You remember when Teddy Bridgewater went down for the Vikings in 2015 or 2016, was it? And the Eagles were able to get a first round pick for Sam Bradford. So maybe there's a situation where they feel, and you know, this is the stars have to align on this kind of stuff, but maybe there's a situation where, you know, a, a win now team quarterback goes down in the preseason bills are comfortable with Jake Fromm, And we move on from Mitch Trubisky. Is that likely? No, but I think there's a world where that happens. So, you know, it, everything, no one knows what Mr. Biss, or excuse me, no one knows what Jake Fromm is now. I'm excited to see what kind of stuff he can, he can put on tape in once we actually get some live preseason football, but that's all it is. It's just, just it's predictions because we've never seen them throw. I'm really glad you brought up Mr. Trubisky because I, I agree with you. I think that if there's any Bills quarterback that's to be traded, it could be Trubisky. And especially like, uh, this might be a little bit of a hot take, Ryan. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm curious if you agree with this or not, but as of right now here on, on July 15th, I think Mitch Trubisky is the second best quarterback in the AFC East right now. You know, I, I think depending on the day, I, I you know, I, I've talked that I'm higher on two than others. You know, I, I think Cam might have some left in the tank, but I think it, I, I think he's in that discussion. I don't think it's some wildly outlandish thing to say that Mitch Trubisky is the second best quarterback with the film and the stats that are out on the quarterbacks that are in this division from last year. So I, I don't think that's a wild thing to say. And I think one thing also going for Mr. Bisky is that he might, you know, he's not, play, they said it when they brought him in, he's not really playing to be here. He's playing to be a quarterback next year. And something that'll be interesting to watch is what his relationship with Dable is. Cause you know, he could very much be a guy that if Dable, when Dable, if Dable, gets that head coaching job in 2022 is Trubisky a guy who can, who will know this offense and can potentially go with him to whatever that next stop is. Absolutely. And I think that's what Trubisky's kind of banking on here is, you know, either that, or, I mean, of course it's not quite the same just because Josh Allen's not retiring as far as we know anytime soon, but kind of like James Winston, where James Winston took a lot less money to kind of come to a, a team that, had a accomplished starter that he could sit behind and learn from a good coaching staff. So, you know, point being here though, is that the bills quarterback room is really, really frankly loaded and stacked. I mean, the fact that they have a guy, Mitch Trubisky, who in most years, that's about as good of a starting quarterback the bills would have and have them as your backup along with, you know, Josh Allen, who I think right now is knocking on the door of being in that, elite class of quarterbacks, I think that the Bills have themselves a really uh, a really good quarterback room that they can be real comfortable about heading into the season. Yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, as opposed to last year, Mitch Trubisky is a guy who, if Josh goes down, he can win us a couple games with the pieces we have around, around them. No, absolutely. So as we kind of go to this next position group, which is the running backs, this is one that's been talked about Ryan, just so much uh, this offseason. Obviously, there were the rumors the Bills were, you know, targeting Travis Etienne in the first round. Um, and a lot of fans wanting the Bills to make a move in that position and really upgrade and get that kind of bell cow, nut clear RB1. Uh, instead, they just bring in Matt Breida. They keep uh, Singletary Moss, Antonio Williams, and, and, and Taiwan Jones all on the roster. I guess starting with Singletary, Ryan, I guess this is my question to you. Do you think that he does rebound in 2021 and plays kind of like how we saw him as a rookie? Or do you think Singletary is just kind of a flawed player and he's more of a kind of change of pace, third down back? I We've seen him. The, the, the thing with Singletary, he's not this third year guy that we're waiting for production, right? We've seen him produce. He led through 12 games through a decent sample size as a rookie. He led 
the league in yards per carry. We've seen what he can do when the offensive line is run blocking. We know he's a good running back. It's I think with hopefully with an improved offensive line, with an improved offensive line scheme, you can absolutely go back to being that four and a half yard a carry running back that we saw as a rookie. And, you know, I think the question is how much use does he get with Zach Moss? Because I don't, even last year, there were times that Zach Moss was the running back one that game. There was times he was the running back one that game, but we've seen him play well. We know he's a good running back. So with a with a fixed running scheme, a fixed ru- fixed run block in front of him, he can absolutely get back to that level, in my opinion. Yeah, I think I think Devin Singletary, although it's clear he's never going to be this elite running back. I know after his rookie year, some people thought that maybe he could kind of break out similar to a Kareem Hunt or someone like like that. And Singletary is not that kind of a player, but I do think he can be a really important piece of this offense and be a very good player. I think that if the offensive line, like you said, because you and me have have been big proponents of this, that if the, specifically the interior offensive line, if they can run block better, I mean, Singletary, when he can get to that second level and he can really use that ability to make guys miss, I mean, he is pretty tough to bring down. He's really slippery. You know, it's just him getting through that kind of past that line of scrimmage. So, if they can open up some holes for them, I, I agree with you, Ryan. I am hopeful that he can return to that level that we saw back in 2019 where had he played a 16-game season based off of what he put on paper, I mean, we're talking about a guy who was an, who would have been a 1,000-yard rusher. So, I mean, that's you know a big deal, especially when you look at how this Bills team is built currently on offense. So I, I think he can rebound. I don't think he is just this sort of change-of-pace player. I think – I guess my question is to you, though, is – do you think that, and, and this is kind of maybe skipping ahead a little bit, but when you talk about like with Zach Moss and now Matt Breida, right? Do you think that Brian Dable is going to utilize sort of an running back committee similar to what the San Francisco 49ers have done over the last few years? Or do you think he's really going to hone in on a guy or two to be kind of the production out of the backfield? I mean, if you want to look at the history of this running back room and how they've used, they've never really gone with three running backs with any sort of regularity. You know, we had Yeldon for three years who, you know, was coming off not terrible football. He was an effective running back when he was in Jacksonville, and he only sniffed the field when when someone got hurt. Now, I think Matt Breida is a more unique talent than maybe TJ Yeldon was, that he's a 4-3 guy. He's, you know, he, he can pass catch probably a little bit better. So I think there's definitely a possibility that we – C3 running backs. I know there's people out there who want to say, you know, they think Matt Breida is going to be running back one. I don't think that's the case. I think Matt Breida could get four or five touches a game, six touches a game, and be effective when they're schemed up right. The same way that, you know, when we had Riggs on here a couple weeks ago when you were gone, he talked about why can't Matt Breida take that Isaiah McKenzie role as a gadget guy? He can do jet sweeps. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. You can scheme up stuff for him to get open. So I think there's room for three running backs. It's just not going to, just because of the allotment of run the pass, there's just not going to be a ton of touches to go around. I think that I, I like what you said there. A lot of, you know, you touched on a lot of good points. I think that for me, I would like to see Matt Breida used somehow in this offense instead of TJ Eldon, who was, like you said, essentially inactive, uh, you know, a healthy scratch week in and week out unless there was a an injury to the backfield just because he does possess you know home run ability with that speed which moss and singletary don't have so i i would like to see brian dable find a role for him in this offense this season i think that that would be really uh you know really beneficial to this offense to have that speed out of the backfield because they have the speed of the receiving core but they don't uh in the running back room I think that it comes down to this though, is, you know, Moss and Singletary. I think that they, you know, they're going to be big pieces of this offense, but I do wonder, I'm not saying that anyone's going to be traded or anything like that, but it does kind of strike me if one of these guys really sort of takes a firm grip of that RB one position, right? Being that number one guy in the, in this offense, is it possible that you see maybe 
a sort of healthy scratch back and forth matchup sort of situation between whoever loses that kind of battle and Matt Breida. Do you think that's kind of crazy to, to think that, or do you think that's potentially realistic here with Brian Dable? Because he is a guy that is big on matchups and, and, and variety really with his game planning. Right. I, I think that's absolutely possibility because when you look at this roster, even just to get down to 53, there's some really tough rust roster cuts that are going to be made in every in almost every single room. So to get down to whatever it is you need to get down to on game day, 45 or 48 or whatever it is, it's going to, it's going to be guys that you're going to look at and you're going to want on the field. It's just not going to be the numbers for them. So some weeks that might be a running back, and there might only, even if we keep breed a Singletary Moss, and at some point they all get some run, there might be games where they are not healthy. Now, if you held a gun to my head and, and you asked me who do you think is going to be the guy who's active most, who gets the most touches, I really think it's going to be Zach Moss, because just look at the way they use them towards the end of the year. I know I talked a couple seconds ago about them going back and forth, but you look towards the end of the year, the guy they wanted to give the ball to, to run out the clock, to control the game, with Zach Moss. I always go back to the end of that Pittsburgh game where he ran out that ball, that clock for seven minutes. And at the end of the game, that's massive. So if, you, if when it comes down to it, if if we're talking about who will be active on game day, I unless there's some significant injury issue still with Zach Moss, I think he's going to be the guy that I that would be active every single day and then Singletary and Moss or excuse me Singletary and Breida being the guys that kind of flip back and forth I agree with you what you said about Zach Moss I, I just I think with Zach Moss if he can be a little bit uh show a little bit more as far as a receiver out of the backfield I know that Josh Allen does not target running backs really at all but also Brian Dable doesn't really call a lot of screens for running backs so much either and I think that if Zach Moss can just be a two-way player out of the backfield, you know, be able to obviously run the rock, but also be able to come into the backfield and be a, res- a weapon in the passing game. If he can show that, I think Zach Moss is RB1 this season. I really do. And like you said, we saw it towards the end of last year. The touches were going his way quite a bit. They relied on him down the fourth quarter at the end of games. And, you know, this is a guy that a lot of people were very high out of him coming out of Utah. I thought he kind of fell in the draft. I mean, there's real talent there to be had with Zach Moss. And, you know, he does maybe fit what the Bills do in the running game a little bit better as far as, you know, he's a guy that is got known for his vision and is a guy that can make guys miss and break a lot of tackles. So I think if Zach Moss can be a real receiver out of the backfield and show that during training camp and in the preseason, he might be RB1 come week one in this regular season. And he's the far superior pass blocker, which uh, people that isn't a stat that you want. Is, it's just a stat that shows up in the stat sheet, but there's a lot of times last season where he's picking up free rushers in the backfield he's very good at that and it's just not something Devin Singletary was asked to do in college it's something he hasn't 100 percent figured out to this point in the NFL so he's a guy that you can trust more on those passing downs and so as I was put going through this room I think the only real question Moss and Singletary are going to be on this team guys I, I know there's a lot of Singletary <laughs> haters out there they're both be on this team come week one and i think the only real question is do you go with three running backs or do you go with four running backs on this roster because you have at the bottom of the roster you have tywan jones friend of the show uh, antonio williams and christian wade and if you listen to this you know the position of the show guys christian wade is not going to be a bill or is not going to be on any active roster seems like a great guy seems fun not going to be on this roster. So it comes down to, you know, Taiwan Jones, who's proven he can be a, a very good special teams player. And this whole roster is going to, the back end of this roster is really going to be who can play special teams. So do you think, I guess, who do you, do you think they keep four running backs? Do you think our friend Antonio can take that fourth running back job? Or do you think, you know, will we find, can we find though, would you, well, I guess, do you think we can find those special teams reps everywhere and just roll with, three running backs going in to the season. Well, the bills have usually kept four running backs on the roster, but of course, usually that fourth running back, whether it's been Taiwan Jones or Sonoris Perry, it has been a special teams guy. So I guess to start with a guy like Antonio Williams, 
I think Antonio Williams' his only shot to make the roster is if he steals that gunner role or just a spot on special teams from someone, whether it's Tywan Jones, whether it's somebody else, you know, maybe it's like a Reggie Gilliam. I, you know, again, I don't, I'm not sure exactly what Antonio Williams' strength are as a special teamer. I know, I mean, we both know, you know, he, he, he won the special teams MVP award at North Carolina, so he can play special teams and play it at a very high level. So I think for a guy like Antonio Williams, you know, if he can show that he can really play some special teams, that helps him out big time. And listen, I, I, if he comes out, he, he, he runs the ball real well during training camp, looks great during preseason. At the end of the day, and I, and I said this kind of, in my, you know, in the last 5A5 report episode we, you know, we went out last week, the Bills are the point right now where whoever the best players are need to be on the field, regardless of where, if they are drafted, if they're a rookie, if they're UDFA, if they're a veteran, it doesn't matter. If they're the best guy you have at that position, or the best guys you have at that position, they got to be on the team and on the field. So I, I would say Antonio Williams, you know, he does have some work ahead of him, but to be honest, anything's possible. But I do think the Bills are going to keep four running backs and one of them being a predominantly special teams guy. But if it is, say, an Antonio Williams over a Taiwan Jones, I wouldn't mind having that fourth running back who's more of the special teams guy also be someone where in a pinch he can still line up in the backfield and be – somewhat capable in offense because you know Tywan Jones great special teamer he's got great speed but he's never been a real running back in the National Football League this that's not a guy you would hand the ball off to you know five ten times in a game necessarily if, if, if you can avoid that so uh, I, I think anything's possible here this backfield but uh, to, to answer your question Ryan I'm gonna go I think they keep four running backs in the roster yeah and, and I think the way to look at it is that it's not really four running backs it's three running backs and a special teams player Absolutely, for sure. And I think that kind of transitions nicely into this discussion with now the wide receiver room because the Bills from basically wide receiver one to four, it's set who the who it's going to be. We already know it's Stephon Diggs. He's the alpha. This is a guy who led the league in receptions and yards. Enough said with Stephon Diggs. We know who he is. We know he is the centerpiece. Oh, it looks like I lost Mitch, so I'll try to carry it from here. Well, uh, he drops out. So we look at the wide receiver. Oh, Mitch is back. What's up, Mitch? Yeah, I don't know. I guess I cut out there for a minute. That was weird. But yeah, no, no, no. I mean, you can continue what you're saying. I was just going to say, you know, was, we already know what Stefan Diggs is as far as, a, you know, wide receiver one of this offense. Well, and so, yeah, exactly. This is a room that even one through five, you want to go with Diggs, Beasley, Sanders, Davis, all making this team. I think the only real discussion there is there to be had with this position group is do you keep five or six receivers? I think it's good. They've kept six last year. They've never kept seven. They've kept five before. So it's not going to be sad. I see a lot of people, well, we can save positions here. We can save it there. There's just, there's not enough ball to go around for seven. There's, you can't keep enough a- active to justify keeping seven. Six is going to be that absolute ceiling. So it really becomes the, but you know, three guys for the last two spots, Hodgins, Stevenson, and Mackenzie, and who's kind of the unique talent in that group. And you have Isaiah Hodgins, who's 6'5", a guy who had freakishly good hands in college, was like a 95-ranked PFF guy. I know we only like to use those when they justify our pride. <laughs> but he's a guy who was super, super talented, and some some draft scouts had him rated higher than Gabe Davis coming out of college. And he had, it sounds like he had a great OTA and we've seen guys have great OTAs and not always pan out, but he (laughs) seems like a guy that the bills are pretty bought into when you, a lot of the same things that were said about Gabe Davis last off season are being said about him this off season. So what comes down to, I think in my mind, at least it comes down to Stevenson and Isaiah McKenzie. And there's not going to be a world. I think unless Isaiah Hodges falls off the train here where Stevenson and McKenzie both make this roster. They are two fairly redundant skill set players who have their own issues with returns. And it's going to be one of them probably end up winning that return job. And I look at this and guys, I know there's, I I get painted as McKenzie hater, maybe rightfully so by McKenzie himself. But remember last time we saw McKenzie, people had that one kick return to Miami. That's what we all remember. But you got to remember, Isaiah McKenzie wasn't a backup returner on this team even last year, even in 2020. Micah Hyde was the backup returner because every time McKenzie touched the punt in 2018, he dropped it. 
Uh, Stevenson, I think, gives you more out of the slot. I think he gives you more of that deep speed, more of a guy you can create on his own. And there's nothing about Isaiah McKenzie's contract that tells you he needs to be on this roster. He's on this roster for either like 1.15 million or 1.5 million, whatever it is. And, you know, it's a coin flip. I could see it going either way, but there's not going to be a war. That's really where this battle is, where I'm very fascinated to watch this group. Is it going to be McKenzie or is it going to be Stevenson? This is why, you know, I, I love this question because I actually think McKenzie is the guy over Stevenson. I, from, from what I've been reading at OTAs, Stevenson didn't really do anything to separate himself. And I think that McKenzie, at the end of the day, you know, we talked about with McDermott, he's all about making rookies earn it, the, you know, putting sort of a kind of priority on the veterans, especially out of the gate. I look at Stevenson's likely being the next guy to quote unquote kind of be the red shirt player for the Bills like we saw it last year with Hodgins, where if Stevenson has a little injury, I would not be surprised the Bills just toss him an IR to prevent him from being available on waivers, but while also keeping him on the roster. I think that McKenzie, I'm, I'm not saying he's a lock because he's got a, he's, he's got a, you know, like you said, his contract suggests that he is by no means a lock because he isn't. If he gets outplayed by a Stevenson or by a Brandon Powell, who's a guy they brought in to also compete for that returner uh, duties, you know, he might not be on this roster, but McKenzie does have, you know, a role in the offense that has been relatively important. I think whether he gets the ball or not, you know, the eye candy of the, the pre-snap motion that he does, it is a thing that defenses have to account for and that Brian Deeble likes to use. So I do think that there's some value there. And we'll see with Isaiah Hodgins. Hopefully he's not the, Des, the next Des Lewis who, you know, everyone bought into that hype. I certainly did back in the day. You know, I thought that he was going to be a monster and you know, obviously that wasn't the case once the Pats came on, but Hodgins did look good last year in training camp. So I do have some hope that he can be on the roster. And not to mention, this is a guy that was sort of painted as a slot player, like a big slot guy. And, you know, yes, they have Emmanuel Sanders, but I would not mind the Bills having a young guy who can really learn behind Cole Beasley that kind of slot role. Because let's not forget, people, I believe Cole Beasley, I think he signed a four year deal, but I think Buffalo can get out of that deal pretty easily after the season and he is 32 i know he's coming off his best career year, but you never know with these things in the nfl i mean john brown came off a career year and got released the next season so um but i agree with you i think it's going to come down to probably stevenson versus mckenzie just because the bills don't have a receiver like hodgins on the roster so as long as he keeps his play he'll probably find a spot on the team but i do have a question for you and i know a lot of people are big you know gabe davis fans do you think that it's pretty clear cut that Emmanuel Sanders is going to be that wide receiver two, three, I guess, depending on how you rate him versus Cole Beasley. Or do you think that Gabe Davis could get out of that wide receiver four role and be sort of that opposite guy to Stefan Diggs this season? I, I think Gabe Davis, I mean, excuse me. I think Emmanuel Sanders gets those John Brown reps, you know, a little bit less top end speed, a little bit more of a tactician, uh, a little bit better of a route runner than John Brown was. But I think, plays a similar role. I've talked about it before. There was a lot of people really, really high on Gabe Davis. And I like Gabe Davis. He had a great year. But I think Gabe Davis is at what his ceiling, not at his ceiling, but I think what we saw is who he is. I think he's a guy that you can, they did a really good job of accentuating all of his strengths. He's not a guy who you can put in the slot at Cole Beasley or John Brown and have a wind underneath. And that's fine. He is really good at what he does. He's really good at being a big outside receiver who runs posts and slants and corners or a big like power slot guy who can kind of be that quasi tight end. And I think that's where he succeeds. I, I think if, you know, there's games where John Brown was out and you didn't see a lot from Gabe Davis, he benefited a lot when there was other talent out there, not just him being forced to make plays. So I think we can see a similar production from him. I He's just not a guy that, oh, I really think in his career is going to be a number two on an elite offense like Buffalo. I think he's perfect in the role where he is now, and he, I think he can keep producing in that role that he's in now. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you, said. I think that at best, Gabe Davis is a wide receiver, you know, three, and kind of has a role. He does have limitations. You know, he doesn't have the route running ability that the other guys on this ro on, on this team do. You know, he's, like you said, he's more of kind of a big vertical threat down the field and someone you can use, 
you know, in the red zone. That's kind of what his strengths are. And I got to give credit to Joe Marino. He brought this up, you know, when I was, I was listening to his podcast the other day, he was talking about the Bills wide receiver room heading into the season. And something that I didn't know, and that's kind of a shocking number, is Gabe Davis, his drop percentage was, I believe, 11%, which was higher than Dawson Knox. And Dawson Knox gets slammed for his drops, but Gabriel Davis did have some 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 pretty bad drops. His catch, rate, his catch rate was like 56%. Yeah, his catch rate was not great. So I think that although Gabe Davis, I think there's a lot to be excited there, and I do think he can get better and improve. And, and I do think maybe one day he could develop into a wide receiver too in the National Football League just because he does have some real abilities. He's got size. He's got speed. Um, you know, but he's not there yet. I think that for him, and and, the, and if they, the Bills thought he was there yet, they would not have gone and spend the money on Emmanuel Sanders to bring him in. I think at the end of the day. So I, I agree with you, Ryan. I think that where he is right now in his role, especially as a young developing player, it's perfect for him because there's no stress on him to have to produce. and But yet there are opportunities for him to go make plays. Yeah, I, I think really he's, you know, I keep saying, I think he's DK Metcalf light. He not a super superb route runner, strong, fast, deep speed. And that's fine. You know, then those kind of guys play seven, eight, nine, ten years in the NFL at a at a productive level. Absolutely. And I guess my one last question before we kind of move into the tight end room here is, you know, we talked about Isaiah Hodgins, and a lot of people are really excited about him. Do you think that if he does make the roster, just because his skill set is so different from everyone else on in that receiver room? Do you think that there's a, a chance for him to have a role in this offense, or do you look at him more as kind of just the healthy scratch every week on the roster? I mean, is he going to come in and, and produce 700, 800 yards? Probably not. Can he be a guy that almost like Isaiah McKenzie, who doesn't put up a ton of yards, but Dable is able to kind of use him to generate touchdowns? You know, Isaiah McKenzie had eight touchdowns and like 300 yards last year, right? So... Do I think there'll be a ton of yards? No, but I think he has the potential to be a really unique red zone threat, uh, short distance threat, stuff like that. Definitely, and, and he's going to be you know, a fascinating player to watch. But, I mean, at the end of the day, this receiver room, they're very deep. They're very talented. Uh, they're one of the best receiver rooms in, in the NFL, and I don't think that there's really, you know, any reason for fans to be concerned about kind of how the bottom especially, because we got to keep in mind that the – the training camp battle is for the bottom two spots at receiver, which are guys that likely aren't really going to be on the field all that often. And if you're, you know, the top four guys are pretty locked and solid. And I don't think there's anything personally to really be too uh, nervous about heading into the season. Yeah. And it's a far cry from when we were debating, you know, who would be ro- wide receiver three, Walt Powell or Rod Streeter. Right, exactly. Yeah, long from the days of Andre Holmes and Jeremy Curley. I mean, I I could go on and on about the, the the receivers that we used to have and how poor they were. But thank God for what we do have. But I want to talk about this tight end room because, to me, Ryan, this room really seems like this could be the X factor for Buffalo, and it, it comes down to Dawson Knox, plain and simple. Does Dawson Knox finally put it together in year three? And from what you know, us fans can read from what's being reported. He's been working hard. He was at that tight end university put on um, by, I was it Travis Kelsey, I believe. Um, so it's, that's Travis, to... it's, it's Travis Kelsey now. He, everyone's, it's a tie rod situation. Everyone's been saying his name wrong. It's, so it's Travis see, Kelsey. It's, it's Travis yeah, Kelsey. I saw that. I did see that. I got I, 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 I to gotta get used to that for sure. I got to get used to that. Uh, but yeah, so put on by Mr. Travis <laughs> Kelsey uh, for the Kansas City Chiefs. But, so, but Dawson Knox has been working hard. And I guess... Ryan, do you think that this is finally the year that he puts it together? Or uh, I guess just what, what, where do you think Dawson Knox should be? What, what, because I'll just say this I think that for the Bills, they don't strike me as an offense that makes the tight end a big part of the offense. Now, that being said, they haven't had a tight end to really hone in on as far as targets and receptions go. But, you know, could Dawson Knox be a 50 plus catch guy, a 500 plus yard guy, and have five or six touchdowns this season, which would be pretty good production historically for the Bills out of the tight end position. Is, is he someone who could put up at least those kind of numbers at this at this point? Or do you think this is kind of going to be the same Dawson Knox we've seen the last two years? It's funny. The Dawson Knox is, I think, the most, maybe even Tremaine Ed, with Tremaine Edmonds, one of the most polarizing players I've seen 
in the history of this team in terms of you have a lot of people who thinks he's trash and don't even know why I'm on the roster this year. And then you have a lot of people who thinks, you know, he's going to be a top 10 tight end in the NFL this year. Man Perino put out a tweet saying he thinks Dawson Knox could be the best tight end in the AFC this year. So I think the answer will lie somewhere in the middle because he has a lot of super unique skill sets. He's athletic. The Bills use him in a lot of unique ways. The Bills line him up as an H-back more so than any other team in football. They don't line him up at all, really, in a slot or outside. You know, I think a lot of the things in this game can be taught, right? I, I think he can figure out how to catch. I think he can figure out that blocking a little bit more. I don't know if his ceiling is necessarily going to be a thousand yard a year guy, especially because when you look at the history of Brian Dable offenses, you go back even to those Browns teams that he was the OC of and and then uh, Alabama tight end wasn't a super important spot in this offense. I think the key for Dawson Knox being successful, just being reliable, have him be that being able to be trusted in red zone opportunities, being able to be trusted in third down opportunities, being trusted on down the field opportunities. And I think that that's absolutely in the cards for him this year. You saw him. He Once he came back from COVID, he was a, not a terrible player. He, he put up yards, he got some touchdowns and he, He's got a relation, you know, I think he's starting to figure out a lot of those nuances of the game, kind of like Cole Beasley does in that he knows where to find holes in the defense and how to kind of improvise on plays that have broken down. So I think he's trending up. I think his best football is ahead of him. I I think his ceiling is a little bit lower than maybe some Dawson Knox fans wanted to leave, but I, I think he absolutely can be a productive, reliable player in this offense. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ryan. I think that Dawson Knox certainly could put it together and, and be a solid option in the passing game for this offense. And again, I think that, like you said, I don't think Dawson Knox is going to be that elite tight end, despite that his athletic and physical traits suggest that he could be. I think it's clear after two years that he's probably never going to be in the same class as your George Kittle, your Darren Wallers, your you know Travis Kelses you know, of the world. Um He's not going to be at that level, but I think he can be a solid option in the pass game for sure. And, you know, he certainly has a good relationship with Josh Allen, which is important to have. And you know, like you said, down the stretch last season, he was a legit red zone option for them. He had a lot of touchdowns, especially in the playoffs. I mean, the guy had two touchdowns in the playoffs, you know, and two pretty big touchdowns, albeit. So I think he does have the chance to be a pretty productive player, but if he doesn't pan out let's just say Dawson Knox comes in it's the same issues with blocking with his hands the inconsistencies that we've seen is Jacob Hollister a guy that you believe could take over that tight end one role if Dawson Knox doesn't kind of step up to the plate I'm a big fan of Hollister he's unique in a lot of ways to Dawson Knox he's athletic the Seahawks kind of lined him up in that h-back spot he can kind of play that h-back role in a similar way a little bit more developed as a blocker, maybe. And he's also got a pre-existing relationship with Josh, right? He was Josh's high school or high school college teammate and probably a little bit more developed. He was kind of a tight end too in that Seahawks offense. But I really like, I think that's a signing that went under the radar. And I think it's a signing that, you know, isn't going to be judged by success if he has 800 yards, but he'll be a guy that once again, kind of like I talk about with Greta, can you design two to three touches for him a game that work out and get you a first down or get you a touchdown or move the sticks? And I think absolutely. I think he, there's a bunch of guys, you know, I I think the story and really, really improving this offense as a whole is how well can we use some of these back end guys? Cause that's what guys like, you know, the pay, you know, the Patriots for years and the, you know, the bucks this year, you know, those, those, Back end guys, can you find ways to one all your other options are taken, uh, or when the offense thinks they has you figured out, can you throw that change up? And I think guys like Matt Breida and Jacob Hollister can kind of be that change up when you need them, and and the defense thinks they have you figured out. Yeah, I like Hollister a lot too. I think that he was an underrated signing, and what I hope he allows them to do because the bills, you know, for the last couple of years, that tight end two position has been 
ultimately, you know, Lee Smith, who is just a glorified offensive lineman. But what I hope Hollister allows them to do, because we've saw in the playoffs how successful you know this was, but if they could run some more 12 personnel, which would help, I think, in the running game a lot and give them a little flexibility having two, you know, able receivers at tight end, I think that that could really open things up for this offense and then just give them more things to defend and have to plan for because, yes, the Bills are in 11 and 10 personnel all the time. They love their receivers, but I think being able to have some tight ends on the field, you know, and be able to run the ball and, you know, give the defense a lot to chew on, I think that that could be really, you know, impactful and really lead to a lot of success uh, this season for this offense. Now, is there anyone – we got three – the back end of this – tight end room is Sweeney, Gilliams, Morris, and Becker. Is there anyone, Gilliams, who's on the roster last year, who's technically a tight end, but he's really a fullback, and was active for sixteen game, all 16 games, I believe, because of his special teams ability. Do any of these guys speak to you as guys who, who could be, who could make the roster? Because, I, I mean, ultimately, I think if it's three, you go Knox, Hollis, or Sweeney, right? And then, I guess, let, I mean, let's go with the last three, then. Gilliams, Morris... Becker, are there any names there that speak to you? I mean, Gilliam, I think you have to consider just because his special teams play was for real. I mean, he was a tremendous special teams player at Toledo and ultimately was, like you said, he he appeared in every single game last season for a reason. I think that it's going to come down, I think, to Tommy Sweeney. If Tommy Sweeney comes in, and we saw a, a glimpse of it, I believe his rookie year, that Week 17 game against the Jets, where he made some plays and people kind of got a little bit excited about him. Can he... Step in, and he's a guy who's also known for his blocking, and specifically in the run game, which is, you know, something that, you know, Sean McDermott and Brian Dable have to be considering after last year. If he can come in and, and really separate himself, I think that could be really interesting to watch. And I think that he could be a name to keep an eye out for if he doesn't show you much, though, in training camp, and he just seems to not really pop at all. I think Reggie Gilliam's probably the last tight end to make the roster just because he is sort of the fullback, if you will, in this roster. He's a good special teams player. So I do think they're keeping three tight ends. And I think it kind of comes down to probably Tommy Sweetie or Reggie Gilliam. For guys like Nate Becker and, and, and Quentin Morris, I see those guys more as practice squad players and stash away guys for next year. Yeah, I, I think you get the nail on the head. Once again, the, the theme of the back end of this roster – who is going to make it for special teams? And Gilliam already's got that leg up because he's played a season worth of special team snaps. Right. I think the only way to tiny Tommy Sweeney beats him out is if he shows more as a receiver and he could be that potential fullback H back sort of combo that Reggie Gilliam was. I think that's really the only way Tommy Sweeney can for sure beat out Reggie Gilliam just because as much as, Teams don't utilize fullbacks so much anymore. I still think that there is a role for that kind of player in this offense moving forward. Yep, yep, I agree. Well, let's talk about this offensive line group, the last group sort of in this offensive preview. And the Bills brought back all of their starters and added a lot of pieces to it in the draft, you know, with uh, Tommy Doyle and Jack Anderson and Spencer Brown. I guess, Ryan, when you look at this offensive line, I, from my perception, it seems like that the tackles are pretty set in stone and that the depth behind these tackles is also quite good and, and large as well, uh, <laughs> physically, for sure. Do you think that it comes down to this offensive line? Is how Do you think it comes down to the interior guys? You know, Ford, Feliciano, Morse. You know, do you think it comes down to those three guys gelling and being healthy if this offensive line improves from last year? Or where do you see where this offensive line sort of needs to get better and where it could be in 2021. We talked about it in the last season that the success of this team or the improvement of this team needed to happen through the interior offensive line. And when you look across this roster, the only places where there are an open starting spot or an open spot for significant snaps that isn't really claimed is that interior offensive line. Will they probably roll it back with Ford and Feliciano? Sure, but we've seen, we know Botker is a good player. We know that Lamp has a bunch of starts under his belt. So there's a chance that we see some different starters there in 2021, in week one, that weren't there last year. I think it's also important to note that 
the uh, the offensive line of Dawkins, Ford, Morse, Feliciano, and Williams never played together for at all last year either. So I think that's something to know. But this line is absolutely we talked about the run game offensive line getting better. And I think a huge way for this team to get better, a huge way for this team to improve. And I think the one glaring hole that really existed on offense was that interior offensive line. Yeah, I think, you know, we'll see. Brandon Bean did speak very highly of Cody Ford at his, you know, I believe, I don't know if it was at his season presser or if it was around the draft, um, but he spoke very highly of Cody Ford and said that he expects him to be the starter week one somewhere on that offensive line. And I... I still have some hope that Cody Ford can put it together. This is a guy that has a tremendous amount of talent. The Bills traded up to get him and has just simply been unhealth, has not been healthy and has been moved around from spot to spot across the offensive line in two seasons. He's not, he's had a rough go at it from, from all aspects. So I do hope that if he's healthy and he, and they keep him at, let's just say left guard, right? Cause I believe that's probably where his, position on the offensive line likely is if they keep him left guard and he really can gel there and keep in mind he's sandwiched between two pretty darn good players and Mitch Morris and, and Deion Dawkins so you'd like to think that they can kind of elevate his play a little bit um I, I have hope for him but we'll see you know Ike Bakker is a guy that you know people were not so high on struggled a little bit out of the gate but I thought by the end of the season I thought he was pretty solid and a decent player for him and Forrest Lamp was a set former second round pick and has all the talent and athleticism in the world and He's a fascinating name to keep an eye on. So I, I do agree with you. I think it, that this interior offensive line, you know, there's some real battles. And and, and more, more or excuse me, Ford and Feliciano, I think by no means are locks and really do have some competition because they they got a, they did not have a good season last year, either of them, really. Right. A- absolutely. Feliciano set back. You know, Ford was hurt most of the year and struggled early on. You know, I made my feelings clear that I very much think Ford's a guy who's going to step up and be a solid player in this league. But like you said, he has to show that. He hasn't showed that. And that's why the Bills hedge their bets with guys like Forrest Lamb. That's why they bring in maybe future depth in a guy like Jake Anderson. And when we talk about the battle for roster spots, it's really going to be, does Jake Anderson make this team does Ryan Bates stick around on the roster? Because, you know, you could go with eight, you could go with nine offensive linemen. Historically, you know, I, I don't think there's really a path for 10 looking at the other position groups. So I, I think that, you know, I, I talked about when we did our show with Knapp and, and Casey that I'm not super high. I'm, I'm interested on your take if you think Forrest Lamp is a guy that can take that spot because he's not a guy I'm super high on, mainly because we've seen him play really bad football and people say, well, we give only give up two sacks. Giving up sacks. Isn't a really good measurement for interior offensive line play. If you're giving up sacks as an interior offensive lineman, you're pretty horrendous. a la Brian winners. So, you know, I'm curious, is there any, I guess maybe even expanding out from lamp. Is there anyone who you think could unseat Feliciano or Ford on this, on this offensive line week one? So I will say I'm agreeing with you. I think Forrest Lamp. I think fans are excited about him because it's a it's a second round pick, you know that we don't know about. But just like Cody Ford, Forrest Lamp, his first you know few years in the league, it's been exactly what Cody Ford has been through: a lot of injuries, a lot of inconsistencies. I mean, this was his first season playing in all 16 games and starting in all 16 games, you know, too this past year. So it's not like this is some. You know, it's not like this is a Darrell Williams situation where he had a year or two of playing at a really high level and then has come down. This is a guy that's kind of been all over the place and hasn't been so consistent so far in the National Football League. So I agree with you. I think saying that Forrest Lamp's going to 100% steal a role from Ford to Feliciano, I think that's a little premature. I think he has a chance to, but he's competing for it. He's I don't think he's, from what I can tell on paper, an upgrade over what we already have. I think the only guy that could unseat uh, Ford or Feliciano, I think could be Ike Bucker just because he did play at a pretty good football. They clearly like him. And on top of that, the key word for this Buffalo Bills team and specifically this offensive line is versatility. And the guy can play both guard spots and center. You know, they've they've trained him at that the last three years 
basketball. He's been on the practice squad and last year on the 53 man roster. So he offers you that versatility, which is why I think Forrest Lamp might not really make this roster just because, you know, you, that at the end of the day, you need your backup lineman to be versatile. Ryan Bates is very versatile. Bucker's versatile. Doyle and, and Brown are versatile guys. So I just think that unless Lamp plays lights out football, I am not really sure he's really making this roster, to be honest. I agree. And once again, it, uh, you know, he also fits the mold of really massive offensive linemen at like six, six. And there's a really funny picture. If you ever go find it, uh, I forgot it was one, it was one of the header pictures for an article. And I'm sure if you Google Ike Bakker, Tyler Bass, it's a really funny picture of Tyler Bass and him walking off after a field goal and Tyler Bass looking like me. If you see my wrist on the YouTube cast right now and Ike Bakker looking like, the big friendly giant. <laughs> yeah, no, he's, I mean, they like the, they like their offensive line big. I don't know what to say. They, they went at it all off season, adding those two monsters and Doyle and, and Brown, but speaking of Brown real quick, I do want to say this kind of before we wrap things up. I know a lot of people are really excited about Spencer Brown and his potential is sky high. I mean, he could, if he puts it together, we could be talking about an elite tackle in the national football league. However, can we please stop with the, you know, maybe he could be a starter this year. Guys, Daryl Williams played at a tremendously high level last year and got paid for a reason. I think Spencer Brown, unless you have, unless you disagree with me, Ryan, Spencer Brown to me strikes, seems like he's going to be the swing tackle slash the big tight end in year one. Is that is that accurate, right? You hear that, Pierre? Mitch is coming at you again. <laughs> no, um, no, I'm with you. Um, No, I, you know, at Spencer Brown, he... He didn't play a ton of college football, right? Guy who switched positions late, played small division football. Um, didn't play at all last year. Yeah, he spent a lot of time with Joe Tooney out in at his camp or Joe State. No, Joe State, not Joe Tooney. Joe, mm-hmm. Joe, Joe Staley out training with him. But a guy who I think will be phenomenal. Give him a year. Let him be that swing tackle. Let him learn behind Daryl Williams. And then 2022 give him the reins, give him the job and and let him ride. But I think he's a guy that, you know, we talk about guys who switch positions and how sometimes you you can have, I guess, a lag going from college to the NFL at that position and and position like that. So I think a year for him to just sit back, learn, probably even bought, you know, you see him in pads, he's tall, but he's not the most like jacked guy in the world probably needs to, you know, fill out a little bit in that regard as well. So I, I think that's another train we, we probably got to slow down just a little bit. Just so that he, you know, I think it can be a fun, I think it can be a super fun addition as a swing tackle. I think he'll be a contributor, a guy who's active all 16 games, but just give him a year, let him figure it out. Let him get his body right. Yeah, I, I agree with you. He's a project guy. Just like we said with Knox and Edmonds and all these guys, he's, he's a work in progress and, you know, we'll see what he what he's turned to do. And real quick, I just realized, you know who we didn't mention when we were talking about the offensive line, which is kind of, I, I think, a good sign is we never mentioned Deion Dawkins, which is probably just because the guy is so darn steady. And I, I do want to ask real quick here because I saw, you know, ESPN put out an article uh, with scouts kind of rating who are the best elite tackles in the game. And Deion Dawkins was an honorable mention. And one of the uh, one scout who I believe is from one of the teams, the AFC, said that, you know, the guy has – Basically said his body type doesn't look like he should be a tackle, but you put on the tape and the dude is borderline elite. Do you think that Deion Dawkins could, you know, is kind of that potentially elite left tackle? Do you think he's kind of on the fringe there? Like, I'm just kind of curious just because, you know, he played, he had such a great season last year. And of course, you know, he's beloved by the fans and everybody, but, you know, I think he's a pretty underrated player, but do you think that he is maybe on the verge of being an elite left tackle or do you think he's kind of hit his ceiling? I don't know if he's hit a ceiling necessarily. I think he is phenomenal. I, I think what you said at the, at the top end of that comment that you didn't think about him. I think the biggest compliment you can give to offensive line, especially as you know, people who I, I can't sit here and, and grade someone's vertical pass set. But I think, you know, as someone who isn't as trenched in the technicalities of the position, I think the big, biggest compliment you can give to him is when you watch a game, and you're like, Oh shit, I didn't notice Deion Dawkins once. Oh, Shit, I didn't notice Darrell Williams once. I think that's a, probably a massive compliment because it's like, oh, they were doing their job. And, you know, I, I think you could go between top 15, top 10, whatever that, whatever you want to grade him. 
an offensive line. You know, I, I've seen him all over the board in different spots, but he's good. Like he peer in like th- there's a, there's tears when it comes to offensive line you have your elite guys, you have your good guys, which he's good. And then after kind of those good guys, there's a small group of guy, passable guys. And once you get to the, and that's why guys like Jordan Mills stick around forever. Cause after those passable guys, it gets icky real quick. And we've seen that. So, and you just talk about his, not only that, you talk about his value. I was just looking it up because I saw Cam Robinson of the Jaguars, who was not as good of a left tackle at all as, uh, as Deion Dawkins, making $13 million this year. Deion Dawkins in 2021 is going to be making $11 million. So, you know, a guy that we have on, in the, like, I don't think we appreciate how good Deion Dawkins is contract really is when you see some offensive linemen that are worse than him and getting paid more than him. So I, you know, I, I really think when, when we talk about most important players on this team and best players on this team, I, I have such a love and affection for, for Deion Dawkins. So I, any I mean, chance, any chance to shout out the snowman I'm, I'm, I'm here for. Absolutely. And, and, and I think that the one thing I always think about Deion Dawkins, if you rewatch the, uh, the bills mic'd up thing for that playoff game against the Colts, uh, Deion Dawkins, after you know completely owning, I don't know what Colts edge rusher was, I can't really remember, but he totally destroyed him that rep. And as Deion Dawkins was running down the field, one of the, one of the referees ran up to him and literally said, "You, you great job on that like pass rep, like you 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 took care of that guy." Like I, I don't know why that kind of sticks with me, but like I feel like it, when the officials are telling you you're doing a great job, like that's how you kind of know you you're doing a great job there. So yeah, but just. Nice to have a, a real steady left tackle, especially one who is um, as, as wonderful as a person as Deion Dawkins is. So uh, that about does it for our 2021 offense preview here as we had a head into training camp. Next week is going to be the defense, so we're going to get down into that. And there's a lot to talk about there because a lot of uh, you know high uh, you know, draft picks were used on that side of the ball. But uh, Ryan, before we kind of sign off here, is there anything you want our viewers to know before we say goodbye? Check out all the great stuff on uh, BF as always. Matt Knows Buffalo hat will have uh, Bruce Nolan on this week or Bruce Exclusive on this week. That'll be a great episode. We have him coming on in a few weeks. Great. Uh, so that'll be exciting. But uh, no, that's all I got. Next week is my, my last week before another vacation. So I'll, I'll be leaving Mitch again for a few weeks after after next week. So if you, you make sure you listen next week if, if you're going to miss me. <laughs> Definitely. You know, I mean, I don't know who would want to hear Ryan's, you know, <laughs> amazing voice here and all his all his hot takes with food and everything here on the podcast. Uh, but yeah, definitely check out everyone's work and uh, we will see you guys next week. So for Ryan Sullivan, I'm Mitch Broder. Thanks for listening. Have a great rest of your day.